Good afternoon, law school faculty and administration, family and friends, members of Cornell Law School's class of 2020. Welcome to the first ever convocation of Cornell Law School to be held online. <clears throat> I'm Eduardo Peñalver, the Alan R. Tesler Dean here at the law school. Today's virtual ceremony is not meant to be a substitute for an in-person convocation, which we still plan to hold in Ithaca at a later date. But we did want to let, we did not want to let this important weekend go by, a weekend we've been looking forward to for so long without marking the occasion. If this were a normal year, today we'd be preparing to celebrate one of the most significant days of your lives. Dressed in academic regalia, surrounded by proud family and friends, and joined by the equally proud faculty and administration of Cornell Law School, you would gather in Bartels Hall to hear from your class speakers and from a distinguished member of our faculty. If this were a normal year, those speakers would talk about the significance of the achievement that you've, that you've made in becoming Cornell lawyers, about memories of your time in Myron Taylor Hall, about the friendships you've forged and the challenges you've overcome, about the adventures that lie ahead. If this were a normal year, I might say a few pithy words about burritos and sandwiches. Sorry, that was, that was redundant. If this were a normal year, we would decamp to the courtyard after this ceremony to drink champagne and toast your future successes. If this were a normal year, it might snow. Of course, there's nothing normal about this year or how it has come to a close, except for the snow. As we gather here virtually using the same technology that allowed us to finish the semester online, the class of 2020 is spread across the country and around the world, participating from a dozen time zones. Some of you may have lost people you know and love to COVID-19. All of you have been affected by the pandemic. And so it might seem incongruous that we're here to celebrate today, to celebrate why, while so many communities and even some members of our own community are still suffering. But precisely in times like these, it becomes especially important to recognize that we have reasons to celebrate. It's when things seem their darkest, that we most need to remind ourselves of the blessings that we enjoy and the victories we've achieved. There's nothing selfish about this impulse. Just as the sadness of the current moment is something we're all experiencing collectively, the same can be true of our triumphs. Sharing both of them brings us together in a way that strengthens our collective resolve. And certain values, the virtue of courage, for example, actually require great adversity for their fullest expression. It's impossible to develop the virtue of courage without hardship. We call the greatest generation the greatest because of the magnitude of the challenges they confronted and then overcame. We need to be tested to be able to excel. As the mighty, mighty boss tones put it, I'm not a coward, I've just never been tested. I'd like to think that if I was, I would pass. Class of 2020, you've been tested and you have passed. And no, that was not a backhanded reference to this semester's mandatory pass-fail grading scheme. Now, many of you have arrived at law school having already been tested. Many of you arrived at Cornell having overcome great adversity and having demonstrated incredible courage in doing so. For others, these past few months have been the moments of greatest adversity in their lives. All of you have met this adversity beautifully, and that is truly a reason to celebrate. By participating in this celebration at this moment, we're not denying what's terrible and tragic about our current circumstances. We're engaging in a collective act of defiant optimism against the power of the pandemic to constrain our possibilities or limit our achievements. And perhaps by doing that, we're giving ourselves the resources we need to continue to struggle forward. In that sense, this celebration is not unlike our beloved law school building itself. The construction of Myron Taylor Hall began 90 years ago in the summer of 1930 at the height of the Great Depression. The creation of such a beautiful and enduring monument to the power and majesty of law in the midst of the greatest economic crisis in our nation's history was nothing if not a defiant act of optimism. That defiant optimism was very much reflected in Myron Taylor's speech at the building's dedication in 1932. On that occasion, Taylor said that he and Annabelle Taylor hoped that this building would help achieve an increased regard for the rights of others, an earlier realization of an age of reason, self-control, and love. They hope that it would lead our students through better knowledge to wisdom, through broader perspective to higher and nobler impulses. Myron Taylor's aspirations for his building and for the legal education that would take place within it are literally carved into its stones. 
You have walked by these symbols hundreds of times during your law school career, perhaps without even noticing them. For example, you might not have noticed the owls perched at the top of our law school tower, signifying the wisdom that Myron Taylor hoped our students would achieve. Or the inscription, World Peace, at the base of that tower, a peace that Myron Taylor hoped the establishment of an international legal order would help us to accomplish. Or the figures that flank those words on either side, judges from Europe, the Western Hemisphere, Africa, and Asia. The stone walls surrounding the law school's courtyard are inscribed with his historic examples of the diversity of legal institutions Myron Taylor Hall was built to support and extend. On the west wall of the courtyard is a depiction of the compact that created the Haudenosaunee Confederation on whose ancestral lands the law school sits. On the courtyard's eastern wall, under an oriel window, the categories of law that make up our legal system are depicted, the common law, statutes, constitutional law, and international law. In 1932, this depiction of a global legal order in which the lawmaking of Asians, Africans, and native peoples was presented on equal footing with European legal institutions was both visionary and radical, which is to say that it was entirely appropriate for the law school of a university founded on A.D. White and Ezra Cornell's ambition to afford a world-class education to anyone regardless of sex or color. In the first years of Myron Taylor Hall, as the Great Depression caused our nation to turn inward and as fascism gathered, across, gathered strength across Europe, this, this building's dedication to legal pluralism, to global engagement, as we would call it today, and to the universal and humane values that underlie the just rule of law, stood as a prophetic counterpoint to the events swirling around it. And although the Great Depression was succeeded by the horrors of the Second World War, it was ultimately the optimism inscribed into these walls that has prevailed. And of course, it was the people who taught and studied within those walls who made that happen. Cornell lawyers of the greatest generation rose above the challenges of their times to help build the new legal order that emerged in the years that followed. Lawyers like Edmund Muskie, who graduated from Cornell Law School in 1939, his early legal career was interrupted by the Second World War where he served in the Navy. He went on to a distinguished career in public service in his home state of Maine, becoming that state's first Roman Catholic governor and later representing it for two decades in the United States Senate, where he was instrumental in the passage of the landmark Civil Rights Act of 1964. Lawyers like Elizabeth Landis, a member of the class of 1948, who despite serving as editor in chief of the Law Review, could not get a job practicing law after graduation because she was a woman. She overcame that discrimination and went on to a distinguished career working with African independence movements and as an advisor to the United Nations. As we confront the current pandemic, I see in the work of Cornell Law School the same basis for the defiant optimism chiseled into Myron Taylor Hall's stonework. Although the legal education that was until this March housed within these walls ended up taking place through technologies that Myron and Annabelle Taylor could scarcely have imagined, this community remains true to their ambition for Cornell lawyers to become the wise architects of a just social order that will guide us to the far side of the adversity that we're currently facing. Just as Cornell lawyers of the greatest generation persevered through hardship, Cornell lawyers of this generation, you, have the opportunity to play a crucial role in helping our country recover from the current crisis. You have the opportunity to respond to adversity by exhibiting tremendous courage, and you already are. But don't take my word for it. Ask your classmates and teachers. Ask the Cornell Law students who have been hard at work with the law school's asylum and farm worker clinics, representing migrants whose lives have been recklessly endangered by their detention in facilities that make social distancing a fantasy. Ask your classmates who've been working with the entrepreneurship clinic to advise local small businesses seeking to avail themselves of federal stimulus measures. Ask your classmates and faculty who are working with local tenants groups to help them avoid the threat of eviction during this economic shutdown. As Myron Taylor well understood, the work of lawyers is never more important than it is during our darkest times. The challenges that our world is currently facing are among the most daunting that we've encountered in living memory. It's no exaggeration to compare the magnitude of those challenges to those our predecessors faced when construction began on the walls of Myron Taylor Hall 90 years ago this summer. Like the lawyers who first studied in Myron Taylor Hall during the Great Depression and the World War that followed, rather than turning inward in self-pity, the members of the class of 2020 have risen to the occasion. You've responded to unprecedented adversity with courage and with seriousness of purpose. You've taken care of one another while also seeking to care for those even more impacted by the current crisis. 
and I have no doubt you'll continue to do so in the years ahead. I could not be more proud to welcome you today to the ranks of Cornell lawyers. Members of the class of 2020, congratulations. It's now my pleasure to introduce a video by a special guest, Mayor Quinton Lucas. Mayor Lucas received his JD from Cornell Law School in 2009. Following graduation, he clerked for Judge Dwayne Benton of the United States Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit. He went on to become an associate at Rouse Hendricks German May in Kansas City, Missouri. In 2012, he joined the faculty of the University of Kansas Law School. And in 2019, he was elected as mayor of Kansas City. Please enjoy his video greeting. Hi, I'm Quentin Lucas. I'm mayor of Kansas City, but more important for now, I'm an alum of Cornell Law School, class of 2009. I know it is a challenging time right now, and a lot of things have changed in really only a matter of weeks. It reminds me in some ways of some of the steps that I had to go through a few years ago. We had a financial crisis, jobs were drying up, and in many ways it made us question kind of what we were planning to do next. But I knew that I had a good education, I knew I had good friends at Cornell Law School, and really around the country, and I also knew that I would get through it. I want to encourage all of you to reach out. If you're in the Midwest, feel free to give me a call or drop me a line, or reach out to Cornell alums everywhere who are making sure that our next generation of lawyers have good opportunities like we all did. But more than anything, believe in yourselves. I know that you're resilient, I know that you've been through a lot before, and I know you're going to be vital to making a difference for the future, not just of wherever you practice, whatever firm, but also for cities, our country, really almost anything. So thank you for what you've done at Cornell. I kind of miss my days in Ithaca. I know that may seem hard to believe for some, but more than anything, know that we're here for you. Feel free to call, feel free to email, feel free to reach out. We're all in this together. And I thank you for being a big part of what makes our Cornell family so special. We now come to the highlight of this virtual ceremony, the recognitions of our graduates. At this time, I would like to turn over these virtual proceedings to our Dean of Students, Markeisha Minor. Thank you, Dean Pinal Vare. We will recognize graduates this afternoon in alphabetical order by degree category on the following slideshow. Please look for your name and know that I look forward to calling your names individually at an in-person ceremony when we can all safely gather together again. We will begin this afternoon with the candidate for the degree of the Doctor of the Science of Law. Following are the candidates for the degree of Master of Laws. Following are the candidates for the degree of Master of Laws in Law, Technology, and Entrepreneurship. Following is the candidate for the degree of Juris Doctor in Master of Laws in International and Comparative Law.
following are the candidates for the degree of Juris Doctor. Please join me in congratulating the Cornell Law School class of 2020. Congratulations to all of you. Before we conclude these proceedings, let's have one more round of applause, this time for the family and friends present here today. I know I speak for all of our graduates when I say that Family members and friends have offered your support and encouragement through the years and in more ways than law, school, law students can really adequately express. As we celebrate the accomplishments of our graduates, we also celebrate those who make those accomplishments possible. Please join me in offering them a well-deserved round of applause. And I, I just I'd like to offer two more words of thanks. First to Cornell's IT and communication staff who worked on very short deadlines to make this virtual celebration possible. Second, I'd like to offer a very special thanks to Linda Maggeroni in the Dean of Students Office. Every year, Linda organizes our convocation and this year was to be her final triumph before her retirement. We wish Linda well and thank her for her many years of service to the law school. And, and now before we conclude this proceeding, Please enjoy the following very special rendition of the alma mater. And then after the alma mater, Dean Minor will lead us in a toast. After that, we encourage you to join smaller gatherings in the online reception rooms we've created for more conversation and celebration.
Please grab your glass and join me for a toast. Graduates, today you join the long legacy of Cornell lawyers in the best sense. It's our privilege to welcome you to the Cornell Law School alumni family. One thing is for sure, you will never forget this year. And know that we certainly will not forget you. So may you face future challenges with the grace and grit you have demonstrated throughout your time here. Or as one of your classmates taught me, to not just keep calm and carry on, but to keep calm and drink tea. And I hope that the memories you have formed here will bring smiles to your face for many years to come, and that those good times will be unforgettable for you. May you find joy in the mundane moments of life, and may your lives and careers be long, filled with good health, surrounded by loving family and caring, compassionate friends. And may the impact that you have on your communities and on our profession be positively transformative. So please join me in raising a glass to the Cornell Law School Class of 2020. Here, here. Here, here.